and welcome to Second Edition News. I'm Cole Mercer. And I'm Owen Monday. Today we see the raise in tuition prices at the University of Alberta. And what the future of our waste management could look like. Later we will take a look at some super sweet supper ideas. And then a possible cleanup of Horlack Lake and what it could mean for the community of Edmonton. If you know anyone that is going to be attending the University of Alberta soon, you may need to tell them about this story. Recently, the U of A has announced a tuition increase in many of their programs and many are worried about the numbers. The courses affected by these changes include dentistry, law, and counseling psychology. The price increase ranges from 17% to 104%, and many are worried that this will drive away new students. Increasing the tuition prices will force some students to either have to choose a, another program or force them to move to another school. I think the university should be doing what they can in order to support the students instead of forcing them to make decisions about money. If these changes go through, they'll come into effect in 2022. If you have ever wanted to go for a swim in an Edmonton Lake, right now might be your chance. Although, it may be a little cold. With talks about Horlack Lake being cleaned, the lake may be available for public activities and even some events in the near future. <laughs> Horlack Lake is surrounded by a beautiful park area that many people from around the city of Edmonton enjoy visiting. While uncertain so far, the city has talked about cleaning the lake up and will be putting most effort into stabilizing the high phosphorus caused by goose droppings. Another big factor that played into the lake's uncleanliness also had to do with the yard fertilizer being used around the park. Officials explain that there have been many plans directed at changing the use of the lake, but it mostly comes down to dollar amounts. If the plan to clean the lake is successful, park goers will have the ability to go kayaking. While the lake may be then safe enough to swim in, it is not suggested. However, the lake is treated once a year for triathlon use, so there may be a chance. The city of Edmonton closed down 104th Street today over the weekend to allow restaurants to expand their patios. hundred fourth street was closed off from Jasper Avenue to 102nd Avenue to all motorists. This allowed the restaurants on the street to practice outdoor dining since indoor dining is no longer allowed. It's planned to close again this weekend, but there are talks to expand it to the summer. The city of Edmonton unveiled its brand new waste management plan during a press conference on Thursday. The city's plan, Waste Roadmap 2024, is taking new strides at waste management in hopes of becoming a cleaner city. The City of Edmonton's Waste Management Plan will be more focused on using less waste. Jody Gable explained that Edmontonians have been more supportive than ever when making efforts to reduce waste, and that the citizens' effort will be very beneficial to the environment and overall cleanliness of the city. The goal of Roadmap 2024 is to stop the growth of waste generation per person in Edmonton. So 0% growth in residential waste generation per person from 2021 to 2024. And holding that line um, where we are currently seeing growth in residential waste generation per person will play a big role in helping the city to achieve its goals for sustainability and climate resilience. A full strategy for Waste Roadmap 2024 will be released at the beginning of next year. Things have certainly been busy around the city, and the local sports scene is just as exhilarating. Did you manage to catch the Oil Kings game last weekend, Cole? Unfortunately not. Luckily, our very own Ben Duran is here to tell us all about it. That's right. We'll also hear about developments in the emerging baseball scene in Edmonton. So, Ben, what have you got for us? Well, Owen, baseball fans in the city will be disappointed to know that Edmonton's newest team, the Riverhawks, have been unfortunately held back from competing in the Canadian division for yet another year. Having been formally announced in September of last year, the college ball team had high expectations for the year. The Riverhawks were set to play 27 games at their home field and another 27 across the country starting June of this year. However, current travel restrictions brought about the decision to postpone their big debut until the summer of 2022. We respect and certainly will follow the guidelines of AHS and we respect the fact that they're going to keep our fans, our community and our players safe. And when it's time, we'll be down here at this beautiful Remax field uh, playing a great level of baseball. In the year-long interim, the Riverhawks will be making upgrades to the Remax Stadium in anticipation of next year's season. Last weekend saw the Edmonton Oil Kings and the Lethbridge Hurricanes face off at Rogers Arena. And for one player, it could have been the most important game of the season. Yeah! 
The Hurricanes won last weekend's game at 6-5, decisively ending the Oil Kings' four-game winning spree. And even though the Oil Kings lost the game, one player stood out in a display of honor. Kate Oliver donned jersey number 16, belonging to his late grandfather, Garnet Ace Bailey, who was a prolific player for the Oil Kings in the 60s and tragically killed during 9-11, leaving behind a legacy of greatness. Skating around in warm-ups, I was like, this, this is unbelievable, this is awesome. So, um, yeah, I was, I was really lucky to get to do that. And I'm, I'm sure I have quite a few texts from my mom uh, right now, just probably pretty emotional from the game, uh, watching that. Oliver wore the number 16 jersey with pride on Saturday night, stepping into Bailey's skates and conquering the ice, just as he did over five decades before. Well, looks like Oliver's doing his granddad proud. Let's hope the Oil Kings can keep up their momentum this season. Couldn't agree more, Ben. If you're an art lover in Edmonton, you won't have to search very hard for beautiful pieces any longer. The city is bringing back a mural grant after taking a year off in 2020. This is to help prevent a spike in graffiti vandalism. Let's send it over to our very own Caitlin Pobersnick with more details on the story. Thanks, Owen. I'm joined here by Andrew Jabs, who is the program coordinator with the City of Edmonton's Capital City Cleanup Program. And we're going to talk about the mural grant that the city will be giving out this year. Why did the city decide to bring this grant in this year? Okay, well, the mural grant itself is something that we've had in place since about 2016. And it's there as a part of our greater graffiti management program. Um, the community mural grant itself is there to act as a deterrent, if you will, um, for graffiti vandalism. So what we found is by having these mural or these artwork installations, the in areas where there's typically high incidence of graffiti vandalism, by installing a mural or some artwork, it significantly reduces the amount of uh, future graffiti. Who can apply for these grants? The applicant should be a nonprofit organization. Um, and so, of course, if you're not a nonprofit, you could work with them um, in order to have them apply, right? So, for example, if you were a business or a corporation and you felt like you had a wall or part of a building or a structure that was in need of some attention, you could partner perhaps with a business association. So, the city isn't going to be giving any sort of like detail as to where the murals can be. It's more so a partnership between a building and the nonprofit. Right. So it's, a, it's actually like a matching grant, if you will. So the applicant um, has to, is expected to contribute up to 25% of the cost of the mural installation itself. The city is providing up to $5,000 that can go towards really any aspects of that mural. Is it multiple grants being given out or is it just the one? Multiple grants for sure. And it is dependent upon how much funding they're actually requiring. Right? So if there's a $5,000 limit, that'll give us about 12 uh, potential mural applicants in a year. And when do these murals need to be completed by? The requirement is to have the mural installed by September the 1st, with a final report submitted by October the 1st. I appreciate you a lot doing this, Andrew. Thanks so much. It was wonderful to meet you, and I'm sure we'll chat soon. If you want to apply for the grant or you want more information, you can check out edmonton.ca slash mural grant. This has been Caitlin Poverson reporting for second edition. Back to you guys in the studio. Spring is here and many Edmontonians are looking for something fun to do nearby. Our own Thomas Wellman has more on a location only 45 minutes away that you should definitely consider this spring and summer. Thanks guys. We're here at Trestle Creek Golf Resort out at Entwistle, Alberta. And today I'm going to talk with general manager and owner Alvin Clark about the new, about the resort aspect of the golf course that's going to be opening up this summer and spring. And right now, with um, now that your giants have just opened up now. So we have the golf course open, of course. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, an excellent restaurant here. And with COVID, we uh, have outdoor dining. So we have two patios, an upstairs patio and a downstairs patio, uh, heated uh, with windbreaks, which uh, helps us uh, keep our restaurant open and uh, a good experience for our customers. As I said, there's a, there's the, a lot of lot of trails and hiking and biking, and, and uh, we expect to be able to open the water slides again in May, like we did last year, and the water skiing, uh, wakeboarding, kneeboarding, uh, open and swing uh, beach uh, uh, come a long weekend in May. We hope to be able to open that too this year, so like we did last year. 
made of like movie theater and stuff like that, or like those kind of amenities? Are they coming down the pipeline? They sure are. Uh, we have that's an erect uh, center, and so erect center comes in, in in a different phase. And erect center is going to be a tier, three tier erect center coming off the beach, going up a hill off of three levels, top level being a movie theater, the second level being a pickleball courts, a gym and a golf simulator and another place to sit, uh, just a coffee stools to, to watch uh, the pickleball, whatever. And then the third level is to change rooms and, and uh, indoor outdoor pool. So an indoor pool with uh, indoor um, hot tubs and a children's splash park with a, a curtain wall wall, the glass wall that opens up from an indoor to an outdoor, makes the indoor pool to an outdoor. On nice days, we open the curtain wall up. Outdoor pool with a, uh, uh, on the outside, we'll have a sun tanning deck with an with a inf uh, infinity pool and, uh, and uh, another hot tub outside. And that sits right above the beach, about 10 feet. So spectacular facing west. And uh, it'll be a facility that'll be a big center, the center of our project. And once again, I would shake your hand, but unfortunately COVID doesn't allow that, but it's gonna, pleasure for this interview and um, we will have to talk to you later or whenever I come out to the golf I'll see you then. Thank you Thomas, thank you for coming out. There you have it guys, if you want a top tier place to come out and, and relax on the beach, do some wakeboarding or water skiing, there's no better place near Edmonton than Trestle Creek. For second edition news, I'm Thomas Wildman. Gosh, don't you just love a good miracle? I sure do Owen. And when we come back, we will take a look at culinary greatness. So be sure to stick around so that you don't miss a thing. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back to your favorite broadcast, Second Edition News. If you forgot, my name is Owen. And my name is Cole. Now it is time to observe some of the most delicious meals I think we've ever seen. From crostata to barbecue chicken, the viewers at home are in for a mouth-watering experience. Now we have Marco Madrone, Blake Fisher, and Nicole Gruber presenting to you some extraordinary eats. Thanks guys, and welcome to my kitchen where we're gonna be making an Italian pie known as crostata. So to start off, we're gonna work with our dry ingredients, which is flour, sugar, and baking powder. We're just gonna mix those right up. After we mix up our dry ingredients, we're gonna then start cutting in the butter. Now we're gonna do this with our fingertips because I like to get nice and in there. We're going to want to mix around our ingredients until it's a nice crumbly texture. After we finish cutting in the butter, then we deal with our eggs. Now we use two eggs and we just whisk them in a separate bowl before adding them. After that's done, we're going to press our mixture into the pie plate. Now it's important to make sure that your pie plate is buttered before you do this. Otherwise you're gonna have a fun time cleaning it when your crust sticks to the plate. After we finish prepping the pie plate, it's time to move on to our fruit. Now I'm using blueberries, nectarines, and a plum. And I've just cut up the nectarines and I'm also gonna add, cut up the plum and add it into that. After we're finished prepping our fruit, it's time to add it into the crust. Now. When you spread it around, you can leave a little bit of gap so that you see through to the crust. After the fruit's in the crust, it's into the oven for the crostata. Now you're gonna wanna bake this at 350 for 25 to 30 minutes. Now comes the best part, the taste test. I have been waiting for this one a long time. Fruititious, delicious, and scrump diddlyicious. Hi, I'm Blake Fisher. Today I'm going to make grilled chicken. Not any grilled chicken. I'm going to brine and smoke the chicken. 
But why would you brine and smoke the chicken, Blake? You might ask. To which I say, don't question me. Let's start by making the brine. For the brine, you'll need half a tablespoon of sugar, one quarter cup of salt, one tablespoon of lemon juice, 10 peppercorns, one half teaspoon garlic powder, one half teaspoon onion powder, one half teaspoon chili powder, one tablespoon chopped garlic, and four cups of water. Put all the kids in the pool, add your water, and then throw the pot on the stove at medium temperature to dissolve the salt and sugar. While your brine is heating up and dissolving all the stuff, and then while it's cooling, you can cut up your chicken. We want to slice the chicken in half. So this is, increases the surface area that you get when you are brining the chicken. Uh, and it allows the meat to cook more evenly. Once your chicken's all sliced up, what you'll do is you'll take your cooled brine, pour it over top, you'll toss it in the fridge for eight hours. In that same time, you can be taking your wood chips and soaking them in some water. Take the chips, pour some water over them, let them soak. Chicken is finished brining. Before we do anything with it though, we need to make our smoke packet for our wood chips. So grab some tin foil. You pull enough out that you can lay your chips down on here. Ooh, that water. You fold it in. And then in on top. And then you grab your chicken, grab your packet, and you're off to the grill. So the first thing you're gonna do is take your newborn son and place him on the grill. Once you've got smoke built up enough and a bit of a smolder in your smoke packet, you'll be able to start putting the chicken on the grill. You'll know that the chicken is ready to flip when you start to see it becoming more opaque along the sides. And once it's all done, you can haul it off inside. Once your chicken's off the grill, let it rest for five minutes or so, slice it up, pair it with your favorite salad, and it's chicken yum yum time. In second edition, I'm Blake Fisher. Hi there, I'm Nicole Gruber with Second Edition. Thank you so much for joining me in the kitchen today. We're going to be baking a no-bake pineapple cream dessert. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm not the biggest fan of pineapple, but this dessert is actually really good. And so the first thing we're going to do today is start making our crust for this. It's super easy and simple, and you don't even have to bake anything. So let's get started. So go ahead and measure one and a half cups of crushed graham crackers and a third cup of sugar. You will need a nine by nine inch pan for this. And first thing we're gonna do is mix our dry ingredients together for that crust. Take half a cup of melted butter and add it in and make sure you stir it well. Next, we'll take our graham crackers and pour them into our pan and just flatten them out on the bottom. All right, let's move on to the filling. So we're gonna take our cream cheese, our icing sugar, and we're gonna blend that together until it's nice and smooth. One bar of cream cheese will be good and three quarter cups of icing sugar. And yes, you'll get it all over your counter, it happens. Next, we'll add our tub of whipping cream. Now add in your crushed pineapple, but make sure you drain it first, and we're gonna fold that into our mixture. Now we can pour that over our crust and spread it out evenly. Now 
Now we can add the pineapple chunks as a topping as well as the shredded coconut. There we go. Now we put this in the fridge for about four hours to overnight to chill for a bit. And then our dessert is done. Wow. There we go, a perfect spring treat. Thank you guys for joining me. I'm Nicole Gruber with Second Edition. Hi, my name is Brandon Demeray, and today we will be tie dyeing shirts. Yay! Tie dyeing is super fun, super nice to do around this time of year. All the colors have a lot to do with the season, so let's get started. The first few things you're going to need are obviously your colors and your color choices. The next thing you'll need are some elastic bands. The more durable the better, especially when you're trying to tie dye a shirt. And of course you're going to need your uh, plastic gloves. These will help keep your hands from being all colorful. <laughs> and the most important tool you're going to need is patience because this sometimes takes a little bit of time and you want to be patient with it or else it's really easy to ruin. For me, my favorite pattern when doing tie-dye is doing spirals. Uh, I feel like you can get more vibrant colors to be shown that way and it's really cool design. It helps if you have a starter kit like we do. It shows you all the neat little patterns you can do and how to do them, but you can easily find all this stuff on the internet as well. So when you start doing your spiral pattern, you can begin it anywhere. You can begin it on any part of the shirt, depending on how many spiral patterns you want. But for me, I like to have one big pattern so you get the best array of colors. So I'm gonna start in the middle of the shirt and I'm just gonna casually start spiraling this shirt in on itself. And then when you're done, you'll have a bit of a rose pattern. So I went ahead and elasticized my shirt ahead of time. Uh, we got four elastics on there. Let's put some color on. Now that your shirts are prepared, let's get the colors ready. You're going to want to grab your bottles of tie-dye and fill them to the black mark at the top of the bottle. Now while wearing your gloves, you'll want to delicately add color and not too much as to bleed the colors together. A little bleeding never hurt anybody. After you're done putting your color into your shirt, you're going to want to surround it in saran wrap. And now that we've got the elastics off, let's see what we've made. My sweater didn't quite turn out the way I wanted to, but I still think it looks pretty cool. I think that's a pretty cool looking sweater. But my shirt turned out exactly the way I wanted it, with the nice spiral in the middle. And that's how to tie-dye shirts. For second edition, I'm Brandon Demery. And that wraps up our very last Team B show of the year. It sure has been a pleasure. And a pleasure it has been. And with that, we really appreciate you, the viewers at home. We sure do, Owen. And with that in mind, have a safe summer break. From Second Edition, I'm Cole Mercer. And I'm Owen Monday. See you next time, Edmonton.